Okay, so test of telepathy using immersive virtual reality. In a sense, this was a, you know, take a quick step back. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of pitching this, you know, hopefully, um, you know, um, this isn't too sort of basic for everybody out there, but, you know, it's sort of a, a general sort of overview and then a talk about the paper that I've just published looking at this project uh, and why I thought using virtual reality was even a good idea. Um, so uh, let's... Uh, Moving on here. Uh, so telepathy, as I'm sure most of you are aware, is this idea that one person can acquire uh, or, or information, thoughts, feel emotions, etc., from the uh, mind, if you like, from the consciousness of another individual or another conscious being, use it or via a quote unquote non usual route. Um, there are lots of different terms that are used to describe telepathy, it include uh, mental telepathy, thought transference, mental suggestion, mind reading, to name but a few. Um, interestingly, it's one of the most common or commonly reported experiences when people talk about psi as a sort of generic. Uh, parapsychological term as sort of psi experiences. Um, in, and yet it's an extremely difficult, it represents a challenge to our understanding of cause and effect. You know, how how could it be? How, how could this occur? How could uh, the, the thoughts, emotions, feelings of one individual be picked up by another individual at a distance? It's certainly a challenge. So over time, there have been a number of paradigms that have uh, explored this, and I just wanted to sort of set the stage uh, here. I'm sure most or a lot of you are aware of lots of these different sort of um, approaches, and they include things like spontaneous cases. What I've sort of grouped together is communication and dream telepathy. So the spontaneous cases are those ones where individuals may have a sort of impression of danger or alarm, often from a loved one, or cool cases. Some of the early cases from Ryan's uh, work was some very interesting stuff. Stuff there. Rupert Sheldrake has sort of led the way um, in exploring um, uh, what I would call communication uh, paradigm, looking at both telephone telepathy, this idea that uh, before we had these these things, um, we used to have those old sort of Bakelite phones um, that you, you know, when the phone rang, you'd have that sort of feeling that you'd know who it was. And, you know, in a sense, it's a love, I think it's a nice idea as well, because sort of he takes those things and then it sort of empirically tests them. You know, can you then, you know, can you assess whether people are or not more accurate than chance? And they found some really interesting stuff there. Also using text and email. There's a huge amount of work on dream telepathy, the idea that an individual, uh, you may be able to sort of uh, uh, transfer or relate information to an individual whilst they're in a particular dream state, usually in REM sleep, etc. Um, there's the, what I call the obligatory mention of twin telepathy study, you know, and I'd totally uh, recommend Guy uh, Lyon Playfair's uh, book on twin telepathy. When I looked at this, when I was exploring the area and I was trying to figure out how we could how we could sort of approach this. I, you know, everybody spoke to me, said, oh, have you thought about twins? And I did look at this and one of the things that I was fascinated by, definitely there's evidence that the, uh, the twins report this closer connection that everybody thinks they have. But what I was surprised about is that almost lack of empirical evidence. And it's not for want of trying, as Guy mentioned in his book, there's a number of efforts been made, but it's, it's actually surprising the lack of any evidence. And it's you know not for want of trying. So it's certainly an area that's ripe for uh, uh, continued research. And what I've called telepathy in the brain. So there's a whole field there looking at sort of correlating different uh, aspects of the EEG, uh, different, you know, if you think of uh, just the electrical activity of the brain and what they're trying to do there is evoke a response in, in one person and see if you can identify a similar sort of physiological response in another person. And there's been some really interesting studies there, not always replicated, or the one uh, very nice piece of work by Standish and colleagues uh, using fMRI, so functional magnetic resonance imaging, uh, looking at changes in blood oxygenation level dependence, so it's literally blood flow. So it's a really nice um, idea. Now, all of that's background. And to me, it's, you know, when I came to this, uh, as with everybody who I'm, whom I've spoken to outside of the field of parapsychology, they're always, you know, they're, oh, there's not much work on this, so there's no evidence. And yet when you look at that, it's a very, very brief snapshot. There is a huge amount of work going on. And the Gansfeld is actually, I think, probably one of the most robust, it seems to me, one of the most robust paradigms within telepathy. Um, and it's a really interesting idea. This is this notion that what you do is you take your 
your pair, your sender and your receiver, uh, separate rooms. And then you isolate the receiver. As you can see down here in the bottom right, this is, you know, our sender and our receiver. And generally speaking, what happens is our receiver gets sort of put in this sort of sensory isolation. Uh, sort of uh, setup where they may be, you know, sitting in a relaxed chair or lying down. Uh, they have headphones on that would play a sort of either a white noise or a pink noise. It's that sort of hint sound. Um, they may have these half ping pong balls over their eyes, red light shone on their face. So they get a sort of diffuse visual field. So there's literally, it, this literally is completely sort of cuts off all sensory input and sort of helps to induce what Honiton suggested was a receptive altered state. And also um, there's some suggestion that, you know, what you're trying to do with this is increase the signal to noise ratio, you know, by decreasing the sort of noise out there and there's there's quite a staggering amount i've put you know some being quite cautious of course but some positive results uh, interestingly uh, for those of you there's a most interesting uh, meta-analysis most interesting most recent uh patrizio trasoldi lance storm uh this one has recently come out it's just going through the but it's really nice again once again a meta-analysis showing that a small but significantly robust effect you know when you look at the the, the paradigm here and, uh, and that's using both frequentist and Bayesian stats. So there's definitely something going on here. Not everybody agrees. If you look at Milton, Wiseman, etc., you know they were they have some contentious ideas there. But certainly, there's you know this is a really interesting paradigm. And there's also associations between things like belief and the strength of the relationship between the sender and the receiver. And this is where I came in, and I was thinking, okay. I sort of came from it from a slightly technical sense, in the sense that, if I'm honest, we had the kit in the lab. And I had my tech guys were saying, you know, can you figure out, is there anything you can do with this? And so I was trying to think of, of, of studies that I could use this virtual reality kit that we had or still have. It's called the Oculus kit. Uh, and when I looked at this and I was looking at the sort of sender and receiver, and it struck me that a lot of the focus is on the receiver. The sender often just sits in another room. They're looking at a computer screen, an image or, you know, paper image or whatever it is, but they're just sort of looking at a target. And I thought, I wonder if we can do anything with that. And so it made me think about, you know, you know, using virtual reality. OK, so first question is, why are you using virtual reality in the first place? Well, um, I think and that was partly what the rationale of this study was as well. It's a sort of litmus test with the. VR could be potentially useful in this field. Well, I think it provides us with a, a very nice immersive environment to put our participants in. And the phrase I like, uh, which I think sort of encapsulates it, is, is it provides you with what I call enhanced ecological validity without sacrificing experimental control. It gives you a lot more control over what your participants are exposed to uh, in, a, in a safe way. And that's particularly useful if you want to put them in sort of um, situations that are highly arousing, uh, et cetera. And there's a lot of research in the mainstream literature showing that, you know, when people are um, immersed within a virtual reality environment, their emotional responses are very, very significant. So they, they're able to produce, you know, virtual reality is able to elicit, if you like, a very robust emotional response from individuals. Often people exhibit um, more or greater, you know, significantly greater recall of information that, that they are exposed to in that virtual environment. And once again, they show greater physiological changes compared to static use. So there's certainly a lot of evidence, I think, that when you immerse people in those environments, they, they are sort of fully immersed in them and they can be really, really useful. And so I thought to myself, OK, well, what we should do then it was literally just flipping it around. I mean, I don't have a, we don't have lots of labs and uh, I didn't at that time and still don't at the moment have a couch for a receiver, you know, to be able to sort of sensory isolate them. So I thought, well, the whole point here is to immerse the sender in a, in a sort of a rich environment. So rather than staring at an image, staring at a screen or a piece of paper that might depict a particular target, I wanted them to experience that, that whatever it is. OK, and so the idea is that the sender would experience sort of uh, uh, arousing, positively arousing um, uh, experience. Meanwhile, the receiver in a completely separate room would go through a sort of semi, um, a sort of semi, uh, uh, what do you call it? 
Anyway, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the word and failing utterly or oh, whatever. Um, but they're, they're not quite uh, in the sensory isolation, but it's sort of sem semi-isolated is the phrase I was, I was grappling for badly. So a sort of semi-isolated phrase, space, sorry. As you can see here, our receiver would be, I mean, this, this is uh, one of the tech guys modeling for me, um, but obviously these would be different people. So uh, what would happen is our sender would be in one lab with the virtual one. You can't quite see, but down here there's a framework uh, that the, the sender holds onto, and that's absolutely important, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, and they can't see anything else around them. There's also an ex there's a researcher in that lab with them there's for health and safety reasons. Diva sits in another lab, watches this GIF, and tries to breathe in time with that. Meanwhile, they're also listening to pink noise. Now, it's not completely isolated in the same way that a sort of typical Gansfeld is, and that might be, you know, might be a weakness of the study and something we come back to. Okay, um, so just a little bit of the sort of technical background. Let me just play this GIF here. I put that in for you so you could see what that GIF looks like. Um, so we managed to recruit pairs of participants, uh, 11 pairs of participants, nine identified as friends and two were married. We also, <coughs> excuse me, we also monitored or measured uh, belief in terms of, uh, we use the revised paranormal belief scale. We had uh, some kit here, two way radios headphones to play the pink noise and gif that the uh, receivers uh, would be watching whilst they're having that pink noise played. Now, in terms of creating a sort of target set, this took quite, uh, I had two guys working with me, uh, I should have said at the outset, um, Tom Sanford and uh, Eric Moyo. And Tom and Eric were you know, spent a lot of time um, identifying clips. Now, the way we did this is there's a standardized image database called the IAPS database, which is very useful because it already has ratings for things like arousal and valence. So sort of, you know, how stimulating a particular image is and whether it's positive or negative and, you know. And so what we did is we created sets of five, you know, five images. So as you can see, this is just, this represents one set, okay? So what we did, Base, we created 10 sets of five images and all of the images were matched for valence and arousal. We then randomly allocated, you know, or identified one of those uh, as the target. And there was a bit of give and take here because we had to, a lot of it might be based on, uh, you know, whether we could try and get or create a clip, a VR clip of, of the experience. So, you know, just to give you an idea, um, in, hopefully you can see this. This is a guy sort of jumping off a cliff, skydiving. This is the typical sort of roller coaster. Um, I'm not, I think you call it, I'm not sure what you call it in America if it's roller coaster, whatever. Roller coaster, hot air ballooning. This is our chap skiing, skiing down the uh, infamous ski slope, you know, jumping off the jump at the end. And this is a, a water slide. So we've got these five clips. And what we did is we identified one as the target. And let's just move on. <clears throat> we then created a sequence of, of, uh, of clips where we embedded the targets in between what we called relaxation clips. And I'll give you a, an example of that in a minute. This is just to show you how it works. So what would happen is the per this is the person who gets uh, put into the VR environment. It's a sort of stand. Everything has to be set and was timed because the two uh, participants were sort of operating independently, but we had to sort of time their responses to coincide. Um, so our sender would, you know, see this uh, relaxing clip of a beach and waves coming up on the beach and they'd hear the waves and the, the idea is that they relax for uh, 45 seconds. Then the video would bleed into a uh, target for 30 seconds and back to relaxation target and so on. So it'll be five targets and at the end there'd be another relation bit. Now I've got a clip here I want to show you. So let me, I'm not going to show you all of this because it's, you know, it's rather boring, but hopefully let me just pause that just for a second. So this is uh, the relaxation clip. I'll play it in a second, but it's just so I don't have to go over the audio. Um, you can see it's slightly curved, okay? And that's because, of course, what we're doing here is we're mapping that uh, 360 degrees image that the VR participants would see onto the 2D screen that you guys can see, okay? So it looks slightly distorted. So, you know, take that into account. So if I just play it, and I can just turn the sound down maybe, so a little bit. So you can hear the waves, you can see the waves there in the background. 
Okay, so the idea is that I need to keep an eye on the time because I don't want it to go on to the next one just for a second. So the idea is that our uh, sender uh, would be sitting, you know, standing in the, in the lab with the VR helmet on. They can look around. This is a completely sort of immersive environment. It's nice sort of blue sky, a few clouds, the sunset and the waves. The idea is that this was just them relax and get into, in, into it. And then uh, along would come a target clip. So let's move that along a bit and it would bleed into one of the target clips. Just so you know, this is our man skiing on the ramp. So again, mapping on that. And that's why we had to have the frame as well, because, you know, people move see this they're sort of like whoa and they jump down way and everything's happy you know where everyone's you know claps etc and they get it so the idea is that you know that's a very immersive well ideally it's a very immersive but also um an emotionally arousing and positive experience for the sender so the idea is that we wanted to immerse the sender in this really positive experience that was slightly um sort of like an adrenaline experience as well It'd make them feel sort of like wow um and, and of course we wanted to find out whether let's move that on sorry ah whether the receiver would be able to um, pick that up so this is an outline of the procedure I'll just take you through it. Hopefully it sort of makes sense, but obviously, you know, if, if any of this doesn't make sense, then feel free to ask questions at the end. So we recruited our participants in pairs. Uh, we brought them to the lab. Um, uh, we then, you know, uh, they, oh, we, we got them to exchange a personal item at the outset. We knew that once the sender was immersed in that virtual environment, we didn't want them to forget about their their partner. So we got them to exchange personal items and it was a ring, it was their choice, whatever they wanted. And that the idea is they held that in their hand as a cue, as a reminder of their partner. So imagine the two people would come to the lab and they would uh, complete the revised paranormal belief scale separately. Then they'd exchange a personal item. And then we'd have two um, experimenters taking the sender and the receiver to different labs. And then the sender would get set up in the VR kit Okay, and then they would go through the sequence where they might see, you know, uh, they'd see a, a set number of videos, which is, you know, includes targets and each relaxing scene, etc. And when what we call the target, you know, when they're seeing we were skiing down the um, uh, ramp, for example, that's when we told them that when this is occurring, we want you to sort of think about, you know, keep that item in your hand and think about your partner being with you in that experience. You know, try and think of them and send that to them. Meanwhile. Our receiver is in a separate lab. They have that set up as you saw earlier. They've got the headphones uh, with the pink noise and they're watching that GIF and they're just relaxing and breathing. They're all thinking of their partner. Okay, and they're trying to just relax and just think of their partner. That's all we ask them to do, think of their partner. And then when the video switches up here, so the sender, it shifts from say, you know, skiing down the slope, it shifts back to the calm beach. The sender just relaxes. It's like, ah, oh, breathe. And then what happens to the receiver, they get a, a, an automatic. This is why it was important, because the computer that was playing the GIF automatically shifted to presentation of a set of images. You can see up here on the right. So it would show them a set of, of the five images and ask them to rank those images one to five in terms of the one you think your partner had just experienced. One being the most likely, five the least likely, etc. And they would do that five times. Then we would take them to separate holding rooms so we could swap them around without contact and reverse the procedure. So the person who was the sender, you know, now became the receiver. The person who was the receiver now became the sender. And at the end, they would then repeat the, a complete uh, another set of new trials and do the same sort of procedure again. And then we would bring them back at the end and a debrief. So that's the procedure. So uh, despite and there was no interaction, I, I say just, uh, it wasn't completely isolated didn't interact with the participants whilst they were doing their tasks and certainly the receiver and it went from the gif to the you know presenting them with the target images and they were supposed to rank them etc and despite the fact that <laughs> i'm laughing saying this because it seemed pretty clear to us and um it seemed quite a simple task you know rank the images one to five 
but one person ranked more than one image with with the number one so we excluded him uh and then we just looked at the hit rate so you know one out of five we compared that to mean chance and as you can see here we didn't find an effect you know uh hit rate was 26 percent okay and you know, one sample t-test shows that this is not significant um, interestingly there was a correlation between hit rate and the psi subscale of the revised paranormal belief scale but nothing else there's no other correlations but it was this bit when i saw this and i thought that's interesting it's not nothing it's close you know it's like 26 percent that literally just taking you know the hit rate and i thought okay well let's do a bit of exploratory analysis so um what i then did is i looked at the top two ranks okay so now it's you know whether they identified the target the top two either one or two and you know since then i've gone back and said well okay maybe it wasn't maybe the whole sort of ranking one to five you know you could think of different ways of doing that but i can talk about that later but anyway i went back and did this of course we did a bond for injection just controlling for inflated type one errors and lo and behold what we found and this was one tailed but it was a significant effect so uh, the hit rate here was 52 percent when you'd expect a chance uh, to be uh, whatever it is i can't remember off the oh chance you see there it is it's there on the right okay so excuse me so you know that was encouraging we were very encouraged by that so being cautious of course um you know i i wouldn't say that there's a clear effect of telepathy you know with some in the literature but when you look at the top two choices there's a possible indication you know and there was a positive parent and you know and i think that what well, part of the the deal was, you know is is it possible it was a sort of litmus test could we use virtual reality um to test for telepathy could be a useful paradigm you know could we develop this in certain ways and i think as a you know as a sort of toe in the water uh you know test i think this produced some really interesting findings um there's lots of ideas you know we've got about takes forward there's lots of issues of course you know this is very much a sort of exploratory sort of you know pilot test if you like so there are a number of issues uh, of course when we reflect back on that you know we assume that those targets used were arousing um in the sense uh, that, that we use those from the iaps database and uh, you know they they were identified as arousing but we took no physiological measures um so that's an assumption and certainly you know that's something we could easily measure in the future so we could go and, and in fact one of the things that we we thought about as well is that you could almost you could look at the uh change well at potential changes in physiology of both sender and receiver so you know looking at uh, arousal levels there could be really interesting it was a bit of an intense trial sequence you know so it was you know for the senders it was literally you know relax target relax target relax you know so it might be better to have one or two targets come back another day run a few more trials you know and so on so that could have been an issue was to some extent well to a great extent was dictated by our ability to find virtual reality clips um, we bought a couple we managed to snaffle a few off the internet um, and it was a challenge we don't have a um, like a 60 camera to create our own clips and part of part of our hope with this is to try and get some sort of uh research projects off the ground where we can start you know now we, we were suggesting that that you know this is worth exploring we could try and apply for grants to get that sort of kit but at, you know at this moment in time we don't have that and it might be that longer more immersive environments might be better and it may be that you know the target pool was too similar as well you know because every one of those uh um tar well, the target and the decoys were all of a similar arousal level um and all of the targets were similarly arousing they were just different types so it was like a motorbike uh racing around the tt uh, man's uh, isle of man uh jumping off a cliff hanging spacewalk skiing down a slope you know they're all very sort of um sort of adrenaline inducing uh, uh positive experiences well i'm saying positive i mean some you know we had to flag those things up that these these uh, experiences are 
quite concerned about our participants you know because they're, they're quite immersive and we had to ensure that somebody stayed with the with the vr participant all the time as a safer health and safety because they tend to move about a bit and you've got to have this sort of stable frame to them for them to hold on to um so other things we can think about is you know we, do we have too many too few trials i mean that's not many trials at all uh you know five trials per participant and in fact i was looking at the most recent hot off the press not quite still under review uh analysis by patrizio uh, and they argue that you know you, you'd need about 320 trials per study unless you selectively recruit your participants, in which case you may be able to reduce that down to about 50 trials. So, you know, that would be an interesting idea. Maybe in the future, what we do is we go back and we selectively recruit, you know, run a sort of pilot, selectively recruit those who seem to do well, and then, you know, run a, a much more robust uh, sort of 50 trial study. Uh, maybe we need more time for receivers to relax um, and maybe even adhere more closely um, for the receiver to the Gansfeld paradigm. Uh, and one of the things uh, I've talked with a colleague up at Northampton, Cal Cooper, about because they have taken delivery of these um, sensory isolation tanks, flotation tanks. Uh, and uh, so one of my hopes is that, you know, I could imagine a situation whereby we've got a sender down here in Canterbury with the VR kit on and a receiver up in Northampton you know, in the sensory isolation tank, uh, and you know, maybe we could setting up that way. So, you know, as well. I mean, that raises issues of its of its own, of course, because it's very unlikely that we're going to be able to recruit pairs of individuals to do that. So, there might be a trade off in terms of you know how well we can match those up. And, you know, the measure of, of success, I talked a little bit about that. So, you know, initially I just thought uh, we'd focus on hit rates. But when we went back and, and looked again in a slightly more, um, I think probably a slightly more uh, open way, uh, but probably a slightly more honest way as well, because it, I suppose it's, it's an assumption that in telepathy, the, well, quote unquote, you know, telepathy, if such a thing exists and if it works, that the, that the uh, receiver would always get the right one, would always get the right target. You know, it's always 100 percent. Whereas, you know, of course, that's that's a bit of a nonsense. It would make much more sense to have, say, six, six options or six, you know, six target options, and then you know, look at the top three and then make a, run some sort of binomial. Uh, because, you know, I think it's much more likely that you know, the 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 t you know that the t the target may be the first or the second or the third you know because it's not always going to be the case that the person you know has to get the target 100 percent so measure of success in terms of hit rates versus ranking that's definitely something we need to rethink as well okay so that's probably enough of me i just want to say thanks to tom and thanks to eric for helping out with this a special thanks to mark and richard our tech guys here at canterbury who uh well encouraged me basically to utilize this kit and help me set the whole thing up and it was very logistically long-winded if i'm honest um it's uh it's something i would like to continue but it's a challenge <laughs> like like so much of parapsychological research uh i see three raised hands already so let's see who we got here um i'm gonna start with uh, margaret moga Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I was curious. Um, I, I've been in groups where we do guided meditation, and that can really bring people down, and they can sink, and then images can start rising up. Has anyone used that sort of technique for bringing people deep and then, and then testing pairs, or, or is that in the Gansfeld? um not that i i mean certainly i know dean radin has done a lot of work with uh, people who meditate but not necessarily in uh to these studies but i know that um meditators generally you know have this you know very very focused ability uh to attend to information that's that's you know that's a given um but there's i'm not sure there's much evidence there i'm not you know that they it would it may have a benefit but I mean, the, the honest answer yeah. is that's an empirical question, and I would love, yeah. you know, if I could just get hold of, I don't know, thirty pairs of meditators, then I'd happily test them. Um, yeah. But at the moment, yeah. no. Yeah, I have another question. I think, and I think Bill Bengston <laughs> will understand this one. Um, 
the telepathy experiments, uh, do the participants ever feel a need to transfer an image? So if they're just arousing, you know what I mean? There's a, a lot of the, uh, the spontaneous, there's a need, the connection. And so trying to design an experiment where there's a need to transfer, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting idea. And, you know, and possibly, you know, maybe virtual reality is, it might well provide a sing for that. Um, as an aside, let me just give, give you an example. Okay, so in um, a colleague of mine, uh, Ross, up at Greenwich, is doing work on scopesthesia. This is this idea that you can feel when people are staring at you. And one of the one of the things that you know that, that plays into this is that sort of the the, equal, the the validity of of the setting. You know, because when we do these things in the lab, it's it's, it's not very um, realistic. You know, putting people standing them in front of a well, whatever you want to call it, a one way you know and then you know, having them just face away and then stare at them or something like that um you know and i know ross did some work where he literally filmed people as they walked down a sort of dark alley around at the back end of their university up niche and they found some really interesting effects because that's a sort of environment where if somebody were watching you you might be quite aware of it um now it's really it's a very very challenging situation because it's, it raises lots of ethical issues and all that sort of stuff so it, i could imagine virtual reality would be a, a a really useful way of putting people in settings that were um i'm trying to i'm trying to think of a nice way of saying this it's sort of um you know whatever it might be scary or uh, uh you know you could it might feel might think oh goodness me this noises it's dark or whatever but of course there's no no harm going to happen to the participants so we have to be very careful of all that so i think virtual reality may be an option where we could explore some of these i mean at the at the moment it, it's uh, it's in its infancy uh, and that's what i would say okay all right thank you Thank you, Margaret. All right, we do have a couple more raised hands, but I'm going to go to the Q and A box, and we'll take we'll take a question from there. Uh, something then upvoted, and I do encourage everybody to go and look at the questions and and upvote the ones that want to be answered because I don't think we're going to have time for all of them. Um, but right now, in the number one slot, Marilyn Schlitz asks, uh, well, "Great study. Uh, are you seeing any contamination in the imagery by using the beach scene as relaxation? Uh, do they have images of beach?" No, nobody reported that. You know, we didn't have anything with that. Not at all. Okay. But um, that, you know, having said that, um, you know, again, sort of if we, so uh, it's, it's a nice idea. And, and you're know, going back to this may well be an artifact of how we um, uh, obtained responses, which was, you know, the receiver would see five images, you know, and so in a way we could train what they were feeding back on. So one of the things we thought about, you know, which would be nice going forwards is you could imagine rather than, or you could do both, you could uh, have the receiver sit and then do the sort of mentation, what's going through their head, any images that come to mind, da da da, and so on, then show them the targets, you know, the target along with the decoys and they rank them. So we might then maybe the beach might come out, but you know, that didn't happen this time, but as, it, as I say, it may be uh, like an artifact of the sort of constrained way that the sort of forced recognition paradigm that we used. Okay, I'm gonna pass the mic to Da Ching Piao. Okay, where is my camera? Okay, thank you. So my question is that, so in this, um, uh, so telepathic experiments, the, the receiver is always, almost often, in putting in a sensory isolation. So basically, uh, under the condition, under the hypothesis that the receiver is going to pick up a signal out of a kind of very low noise. So what if, I'm just answering, uh, what if the receiver is also given a set of VR, and so the sender has a VR, receiver has a VR. So then they do VR, so they are playing. Absolutely. Exactly. We've already thought about that. Put them both in exactly the same environment. I mean, that would be, a, I mean, in fact, there was a study done, and I'm trying to, I'm just going to dig out the reference for you. Uh, if I can remember it off the top of my head, which I can't. And then, uh, I can't remember the guy's name. But it was uh, one study done where, uh, a group of researchers looked at this they didn't find an effect but they had they literally had a single trial um and it was you know i don't think it was very well designed so i i, I think that this is for me this was like a sort of exploratory idea you know or an, an exploration of 
is it you know is there any mileage in using vr in this sort of area i think there is and i you know what i'd love to have is you know more kits with you know better quality images maybe ones that we could create ourselves but absolutely i think that that you know offers a really interesting uh, environment where you could put both sender and receiver in the same environment maybe have then have the sender you know pick up a virtual object and see if the receiver goes to the same op you know something like that you, you know measure it in different ways there are lots of things you can do there but yeah that would be a fun that would definitely be a fun project anybody out there with vast sums of money who would like to fund parapsychological research just let me know <laughs> but okay. yes that's a great question thank you very much thank you okay um, I'm going to take another one from the Q&A. Uh, thank you for your upvotes, everyone. The next uh, most popular question. Um, Bjork is asking for clarification on how you identify the target in a sequence of five target clips. Random. Well, it's a combination. As I said, it's, well, pseudo-random, I suppose. To some extent, it was it was driven by how, how easy or difficult it was to find a VR clip. So, so taking a step back, we had sets of five images. Those images were matched for and arousal according to the IAPS database. So according to them, they're all sort of, um, you know, similarly arousing and similarly positive. Now, and I hold my hands up and say, you know, of course, that's uh, static images. There is no uh, database of virtual reality clips yet and maybe that's something that you know if somebody with vast resources and and time could do but i mean that you know this is because over time researchers um often utilize these sort of standardized databases of words and the images because they're really really useful um so there was no sort of go to uh, set of images so we use those images those those static images as a guide and then it was driven mostly by whether we could get a vr clip of one of those since we're talking about uh, images, another question comes from Mark Urban Lorraine. Uh, he's asking, are the five images presented to the receiver all on the screen at the same time or sequentially? All on the screen at the same time. So literally as I would it, you see that, that five and then the little spaces underneath and they're supposed to plug in one, two, three, four, five. That's it. So they just rank them according to, you know, how they, one is the, the, the uh, experience that they think their partner just had, five least likely. Right. I'm going to pass the mic to Damon Abraham. Hey, super interesting stuff. I really, really to talk. Um, with respect to the high arousal images, um, I'm wondering if the immersion uh, that you're doing on the sender could almost be counterproductive in some sense, right? Because the arousal, I could see enhancing the, uh, the receiver, right? If you had a loved one that is going through some kind of trauma, you might pick up on that arousal. But at the same time, you could be undermining the fidelity of the details. And the reason I say that is from the perspective of the sender, um, you're encouraging like a visceral uh, kind of experience with these high arousal images. And since they're so engrossed in the uh, activity itself, they may be uh, sufficiently dedicated to the sending process, right? Does Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, that was one of the reasons why we had them swap an item at the outset and had, the, you know, when the sender was, you know, in the VR, they would hold this object to, and we, you know, sort of emphasize to try and remember their partner because, you know, we recognize that to some extent when you put someone in this situation it's it's distracting and immersive and they could completely forget about you know all the things we've just asked them to do and and just go wow this is fun and you know, <laughs> you know which is great but it's got you know that doesn't really help us um and it may well be that um that what we might need to do is run through some sort of like a like a like a not an evaluation process but a sort of familiarization process so you know the person because the other thing is this this um the oculus when you wear it it's actually quite heavy i mean you've got these straps on the head and stuff um but it gets quite warm and it's quite heavy so it's not ideal 
um, by any stretch. Uh, but I think there are ways that we can sort of address some of those issues to try and bring them back. I'm almost wondering if you can you really leverage the immersive experience to enhance the relaxation and get people in a in a in a mind where they might be more optimal for sending. And then you could even have like a floating still image inside of that beach scene, for example, and have them send it and not necessarily have to be a high arousal image, just the fact that you're you're encouraging the relaxation process that might be conducive for a sender as opposed to the exhilaration process that might be more conducive for the receiver. That may well be. I mean, there, there's lots that we could explore. The reason we chose high arousal sort of positive valence images is because there's, there's quite a bit of research in the literature showing, saying that, you know, arousing images that are, if you like, not static, you know, multi-sensory targets tend to be better or people tend to do better with these. Uh, yeah. and that, was, that was basically it. I mean, sure. uh, it's not it's not by any stretch um like the end i would you know as i say i think i consider this to be sort of the beginning i think it's uh you know this seems to be suggesting that it could be useful so let's see where we can take i, th I think there's you know really can be taken in lots of different directions okay so i've got um, a lot of questions and comments from Marilyn Flitz, and uh, she seems to be having trouble with the raise hand feature, which is having some tech issues. So we're, we're, we're going to go through some of her questions and comments. I'll, I'll have to be her proxy. So uh, the first thing, uh, she says that she has a VR set up and would love to explore some collaborations. Okay. Um, and let's see, uh, a couple of suggestions. Um, she suggests using rating rather than ranking for the judging. Okay. Um, and suggests that you might not be powered for significance. Instead, perhaps effect size would be a better way to present. Do you have any comment on that? No, I'm happy to go with that. <laughs> that's, that's fine. It makes sense to me. I mean, you know, this was very much a pilot. I, you know, with 11, I'm surprised we found, we found with 11 pairs. Um, you know, I would much prefer, you know, a, a more robust study. But the reality is, you know, these things, you, it's a step, it's a stepped process, if that makes sense. You know, you, I run it, we do this first. Um, the, the part of the rationale is, I'm not sure if, you know, if obviously if this doesn't make sense, then, you know, I'll explain it. But part of the rationale is as us as researchers are often trying to get funding to run research projects. But often we have to show a sort of proof of concept before we can apply for that fund. That was really the basis of this study. It's basically saying, I think that there's mileage here. Now what we can try and do is apply for some funding to different organizations and also to the university itself and say, you know, please give us a virtual reality camera and other kit, etc. So, you know, that's that was part of the deal. But absolutely, I mean there's lots of there are, you know, was it there's always more questions than answers. But you know, I think this is a, I think it's also quite a fun and interesting area. Speaking of more questions, we, we have a lively line of raised hands. So I'm going to I'm going to pass the mic to Carl uh, Medvedev. I hope I said his last name right. Yeah. Hello, David. I just thought I'd um, offer a little commentary about your use of a potential use of a float tank. I went in 30 years ago, and all I can tell you is I didn't. It, nothing really happened when I was there, but when I walked out, it felt like gravity had been dialed back, and I just felt like so clean and a couple meetings ago someone was saying we got, i think it was paul smith about so that the cleanest recipient signals were ones found when people were hundreds of feet under underwater in a submarine so um so i'd encourage you to play with that <laughs> i well I, that would be nice i don't know anybody in a submarine i mean what one of the things i'd yeah. ask though is, is your um experiences in the isolation um tank uh was that like was it just one uh one off or is it something that you regularly no did? it was a one-off and i didn't really have the knowledge 30 years ago that i have today and the other thing is it was sort of like a giant eggshell with a gullwing door and in the top of it was a um was a tv screen so they, <laughs> they i mean so that that you could use that as option and the yeah. idea was they should like you were in Star War, Star Star Trek, going warp ten, and the stars were going by, and you could just kind of like doze off. And so it, you know, while it was happening, I just didn't really feel anything was really happening. But when I got out, 
It was like, wow, what just happened to me? And it wasn't like anything magical. It's just I felt like so clean. It was just like I thought, whoa, this is crazy. And I didn't really have anything to go on, right? It was kind of a gift from a friend. So, um, so it just kind of blew me. So, and then if you start thinking about it, you're sitting in 600 pounds of Epsom salts. Does that have something to do with anything? Who knows? But, um, yeah. you know, so I just think, you, and you get people in a very, very relaxed state. And my suspicion is rather than isolation and having thought about it, it's just reduced activity, you know, so it's not so much you're isolated, but just nothing's going on in your mind is idling when it's normally running, doing who knows what with all kinds of distractions. Right? So that's my, those are my suspicions. And I mean, in a way, that's uh, again, uh, it's it's a, it's an empirical question. Uh, take you know, keeping a sender in a VR environment and having a receiver, you could have a receiver in a sort of the pink noise and etc. Uh, or you could put them in you know an isolation tank. I mean, the question is, you know, which of these is better? I mean, these for me, these are empirical questions. Uh, I you know want to know what the data says. Okay, so hold on a second. Um, Philip Brown has a question at the top, but I'm actually going to hand him the mic in the moment. But uh, in the meantime, there's a question from Bra. Uh, she says, "Roller coaster may be fun and arousing, or it might be traumatizing. Any accounting for the difference?" It's an interesting question. I mean, we. We had to flag up to our participants at the outset that these were what we considered to be adrenaline inducing experiences, um, uh, but we couldn't show them the experiences beforehand because otherwise, you know, then, you know, then we sort of ruin the, the process. But, um, you know, that's I mean, that, that's the true because, you know, we did say, you know, for example, it involved you know, jumping out of an airplane or standing on the edge or you know, climbing up a very tall building. So if you are afraid of heights or if you're um, you know, if you have if these are issues for you, then don't participate. You know, so we did sort of flag that up and part of our ethics was that we had to make that very very clear at the outset that it could be quite now because there's one i think there's a space walk which is if you suffer from vertigo you might that might be problematic um yeah it's a challenge i think uh, i mean it's an interesting idea i mean it's part of my mind is just going down this avenue think well you could imagine i quite like the idea of uh, of setting people up um you know so you could have say pairs uh, of of people who suffer from say arachnophobia and then you know expose one of them to spiders and see if the other one responds or something i mean you again you have to be very cautious how you do that ethically but mm -hmm. once again my point would be that you know vr allows you to sort of do this in a safe environment i mean you have to be careful quite how much you tell your participants so you don't prime them bias them or whatever mm -hmm. you know but at the same time you can't just sort of uh you know you know shock them <laughs> having heart attacks but i think it's real scope i really do i think there's real scope i'm going to pass the mic to philip brown hello philip good evening Hi, David. Thank you for your presentation. You're very welcome. The comment that I have is that in the example of five images that you gave us, there was an image of somebody falling off a cliff. It was a roller coaster, uh, the ski slope, and the water slide. And I don't remember the fifth one, but... Hot, hot air ballooning, but yeah, that's it. Okay. Well, at least four of those images have the sensation of falling. So... Or at least, I think it, I think that would be the dominant sensation of falling. So, I think if the sender transmitted the sensation of falling, it would be hard for the receiver to decide which of those four images would be the correct one. So, I mean, th that was just one example that that you gave us. Uh, I, I don't know what what your other examples were, but I think they would have to be a, a qualitative difference. For example kicking a ball or being attacked by a swarm of bees or things that are really different in, in a qualitative sense, that would be easier for a uh, receiver yeah, no. to. No, I mean, that's, again, I, yeah. I, 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 I'm not sure because, yes. you know, I would just say that's an empirical question. You know, yes. there are two ways you can deal with that. I mean, I think the fact that, you know, as I think it was Marilyn who was saying earlier on to somebody, you know, one of the things we could definitely do is allow the receiver to 
just sort of verbalize, go through these mentations. So maybe those points would come out in that both both the similarities and you know the the fact that they might pick up on the relaxating in the beach and stuff like that but the issue is you know when we show them the set the the, the images um uh and they have to pick one um you know the question is do they get the one you know, get the target right more than chance or even if we look at the effect sizes i mean that's that's the issue um i think if they're a similar i mean i mean in an ideal world well i don't know it's an interesting question. You know, do you, you want them to be sort of sort of similar in the sense, well, possibly arousing, stimulating, but perhaps different in as a, you know, not necessarily having the same, I don't know, the same sort of, uh, I'm trying to think of a way of encapsulating all of that. Uh, maybe less movement or something like that, because all of them, well, perhaps not even less so the hot air ballooning probably, but movement, there's a lot of movement going on. So maybe you could have something more static or something like that, which you, something happens to you. So, but that's, you know, that's definitely true. And over time, perhaps, we may be able to build up a database of of images and then begin to sort of write them and classify them in different ways in the same way that you know the iaps has already done so we were sort of restricted to some extent by well we were we were we sort of relied on um we made assumptions i suppose is the honest answer there we made assumptions about the arousal and valence of the clips based on the static images and that that might be way off we may be off base there completely um you know it might be looking at an image of a i don't know looking at an image of a man skiing down the slope is, you know might be interesting and arousing but not as you know stimulating and as arousing as if you experience it in a vr environment whereas you know looking or being in a hot air balloon might not be you know so whilst they you know static the static images have similar arousal ratings the vr clips may be very very different so you know that's something else we would we would need to sort of start to look into. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay. So we're we're getting close to the hour, but I got one more raised hand, and we've got a few more questions chat. But I'm going to take one last raised hand and one more question. So I'm passing the mic now to York. In the meantime, uh, please please go upvote the uh, leftover question so I can choose the final one. <laughs> York. Good evening. Uh, Yes, good evening. Um, I'm afraid that I am still unclear on this question of target selection, because as I understood your description, uh, one session consists of five different VR clips uh, interspersed with resting periods of the beach scene. Yep. And then your uh, target identification, the ranking you, you choose to decide uh, uh, what's... Uh, no, uh, no, hold on a second. What you saw or what I gave you was literally one trial. So there are five trials within that VR clip where you see like resting beach, but then there's a target clip, beach rest, target clip. And every time the, the sender sees that target clip, after they've seen that in that rest phase, that's when the receiver would see on their computer a set of five images relate one relating to the the target you know four decoys so it'll be you know f there were five sets of five if you like oh so the receiver needs to make a selection of what they think was the target within the trial period during the 45 seconds that the sender is is relaxing with the beach view yep that's exactly it uh, okay, that raises a, a lot of question issues, but we're short on, on time. Okay, so let's see what the winning last question is. Um, all right, Diane asks, have you thought of recruiting pairs of people who <laughs> only experience telepathy together? In my experience, I have particular people who are <laughs> Oh, God. Oh. It's like the twin question. It's, you know, uh -huh. whenever, it's like when you talk about telepathy, this, I wanted to have, like, there should be like a little cup that I could give out at talks and whoever asks the twin question. Uh, yes, of course, if we've considered that, like we've considered meditators, we've considered married couples. And the reality is, it's what, I mean, it's, 
what was amazing was how long it took like three months to get this 11 people in the lab and unreal yeah of course we've considered it i just don't have uh you know mouth hairs or, or whatever it is or telepathy buddies or all that all that stuff i mean it's i mean actually just as a, an aside you know it, it raises an important point because it's this notion of if you like pre-screening participants mm -hmm. and one of the things from patrizio's recent um analysis is that you know pre-screen your participants you know if they've got some ability less trials and that's a good idea um and we've tried that in the past with the i do other um, research on um the sort of darem pre-cognitive retroactive um uh, facilitation stuff we tried a pre-screening trial there and we i mean we're still we're running another one actually uh, um uh, in the coming year but it is just a nightmare trying to get these people to come back <laughs> because, you know get, getting them to come to the lab is hard work getting to getting them to come back you know when we don't have like large sums of money to pay them is is tremendously difficult uh and i i don't, I don't know um we've tried to hook up with various sort of buddhist centers around canterbury but they're just at the moment with lockdown it's and that's a challenge you know we've been locked down for over a year so no lab research everything's gone and had to shift online so we've been very restricted but yeah of course i'd love to do that and I, you know who wouldn't but right. the reality is it's often a lot more difficult to get these people to come to the lab mm -hmm. and more than once that makes sense well this has been an epic q and a <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, I, you know, well if anything else i mean that's exactly it for me that would be it i would like i would like this to stimulate people to ask more questions about you know where mm -hmm. what could we use this for where could we take it and i really do think that there's a whole range of different areas where you know kicking around ideas for vr kit uh, and you know and i think it's a lot of fun and i think that aspect of it the fun aspect is actually important as well i mean i've been 20 years in psychology experiments where we literally bore the pants off our participants and and i think you know parapsychology is no different you know endless boring trials of this that, and the other. and i just think if you know try and make it a bit more fun we might actually find some more robust effects so uh, and that if everybody has fun that's a good thing that's a good thing exactly <laughs> all right well thank you so much uh, you're welcome